Thank you very much. Last but not least is Darshak Sangabi. Darshak directs the Population and Preven Preventive Health Models Group at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, so I think I'll start with two broad observations, and I'll talk about sort of the way we are trying to affect this area. The first is, well, I say, well, we talk about scale. Um, Medicare, Medicaid are, by definition, at scale. Uh, the annual budget tops over $700 billion per year. Um, tens of millions of people receive services and get it paid for through Medicare and Medicaid. So right away, whenever uh, a large payer like Medicare does something, that already is at scale. But along with that, we say, well, what does that really mean? Like, it's so scale, what are we talking about? And I think that in the context of what we're speaking about here, the broad concept that we are now pursuing as an organization uh, at, at the highest levels is to say that if we are going to be treating the whole person, which is really what community health is, what population health is, then we should be paying for the whole person. Um, which broadly, in its most basic form, says we are transitioning away from fee-for-service medicine. But what, is that, what that really means much more broadly is saying, what, what is the glide path to get there? How are we going to get to value-based payments and ultimately really to population-based payments? Um, and that is the broad trend and some of the really important goals for CMS now. We're now at about approximately, I believe, 20% of all payments um, that are being made are value-based. Um, and we are looking at sort of creating a glide path to actually trying to increase that um, as time goes on. Because you have to have a critical mass of payers in order to actually get uh, tipping points so that many, uh, in, um, many organizations feel they can start to invest in the kinds of things that will lead to population community-based health. The second broad observation I would make is um, uh, I'm a, in addition to doing health policy, I'm a clinician. Um, I also have two kids. Um, and I say to myself, well, look, like I've been sitting in these chairs all day. Uh, I don't think I ate very healthy today. Um, in the past, um, like many other people, uh, when I was a fellow in cardiology, I think I put on like 35 pounds. Um, and sort of losing that and sort of transforming the way I ate it took a great deal of effort. So the other thing I think about is um, when we talk about community population-based health, we should be as inclusive as possible. We have a tendency to sort of segment that, to say, well, oh, those, we need social services for these people. These people need fancy uh, neighborhood intervention. Why don't we have walking paths here? And then I take even just flip the switch to how we are at CMMI, and I think that we actually are in a food desert and everybody just sits at their desks all day. So I say to myself, well, look, what kinds of interventions, how generalizable are they? And the other, so the other lens I have is we, I, at least my personal opinion is I am not as interested in segmenting the market to say we need to focus on these poor people. I think that is politically not as powerful as saying, well, what are the broad incentive structures we need to develop so that all people can buy in uh, and support something? I think that's part of scalability as well. So I'll just uh, open with that because I think there's a rich discussion we could have around each of those topics. And just briefly touch on the two areas um, where um, I think the term we're supposed to use is exploring because we, we don't like to signal exactly what it is we're doing um, <laughs> until it's really out. So the two areas that we are exploring in my group, um, and I just want to touch on them just to give you a flavor of where we're going. We have limited resources, so we can't do everything. We need to cone down and be very clear about the models that we're trying to put forward. Those two models that our group is developing focus on the following. The first is that it's very hard to make a case for prevention. You know, particularly when you have insurance churn and so forth. You know, academic papers look at that like, oh yeah, you know, if you invest in early childhood education, you'll save all this money in the future. That just does not resonate with payers. I mean, it resonates with me. Uh, as a public health advocate, a child health advocate, but it just doesn't resonate with payers. How do we put that into terms that payers can understand? And so the idea, the very broad idea, is that we are looking to explore predicting what's going to happen to people based on robust predictive analytics and then finding a way to pay for reduction in aggregate risk, hypothetically. You can go on, and this is sort of what we're like, you can all download an app to your iPhone right now. This is endorsed by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. I have it on my phone. You put in your age, sex, race, total cholesterol, HDL, blood pressure, are you a smoker, are you getting a treatment for hypertension, and do you have diabetes? It will tell you, if you're over the age of 18, in the next 10 years, what is your risk of having a heart attack or stroke? 
This is very well developed. This is under the best data we have. And so our model that we're considering right now and exploring is to have everybody calculate that risk and then incentivize people to lower that risk. In other words, we don't care how you get there. So-and-so may want to lower blood pressure. So-and-so may be interested in cholesterol. So-and-so may be into anti-smoking. And this is not a new idea. You know, this is sort of, you know, but to do it at scale, this is what we're talking about here at CMS. This is a fairly different way for CMS to think about things. And some of you, you know, Kaiser Permanente in, North Car in Northern California is thinking about, you know, has stuff on this. We've talked to other folks as well. There's some complicated issues that need to be worked out. But I'll say it's about reducing cardiovascular risk, but it's actually about something entirely different, which is creating a new paradigm to think about how do we pay for prevention. The second broad model, if I have a little bit of time, is um, this thing we call an accountable health community, which you know, means different things to different people. Um, but I'll tell you what it means to us, which is that we believe that if you're going to be investing in community health, again, we speak the language of payer. You have to demonstrate that you are substantially improving quality or reducing costs. Of course, when you give money to smart people, they do smart things. There is no debate about that. But how do you actually show that you should continue to invest in those, in those smart people and those smart things? What we are thinking about doing right now is developing a three-track model that will be on a national scale. Take a hypothetical veteran who's homeless who's just been discharged from the hospital. There are three ways that that veteran could be taken care of in this model. The first is that we'll give him a piece of paper. Hey, uh, these are the homeless, uh, these are services that can help you. We've done a community-based thing. Take this piece of paper, please call them. Good luck. That may not sound like a lot, but that's actually much better than we often do in a lot of places here. We're going to call that the low-touch, high-volume model. The second model we could say is, hey, if you're that veteran, we're going to say, not only are we going to give you that piece of paper, we're going to give you this person. This individual whose job it is to make sure you actually call them and you connect with those services and follow up for a period of time. That's what we're going to call the medium touch, medium volume model. And then the third is not only going to give you the piece of paper and we're going to give you a person, but we're also going to invest in creating some sort of durable linkages among the actual people delivering the services. So those are going to be the three tracks of this model. You can see, you can think about this almost like a drug trial. There are three different areas of increasing dose of community engagement. And then what we would like to do is then there's an internal control built in, and then we may look at the total cost of care over time. And so we believe this is at least another way that we can demonstrate how is it that we can show and essentially prove that investing in these types of services actually makes sense. And then we can pursue all of the innovative financing strategies, whether at the state level, national level, or other places, to then guide people to say, this is how we'd like to continue. So I think we all have a brief period of time. Happy to talk about a variety of other things that the Innovation Center is doing. You each have a list in your packet of sort of a long list of the models we're pursuing. But I'll stop there.